بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة الأبدية على أعدائي مجمعين لقيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my beloved sons and daughters so inshallah we are going to take lesson 3 because lesson 1 and lesson 2 was introduction uh, it's available on YouTube uh, however let me just make a quick review uh, of lesson one and two in case for those who uh, uh, would like to just uh, get a gist of what was there in lesson one and lesson two. So basically in lesson one, uh, let's uh, make this uh, bigger. So, so lesson one was an introduction. So this is our, this is our theme. This is, this is the, this timetable or this is the, the 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 table which is going to be our index. This, as they call it, khema. So this is going to be our index. So tafsir, method, uh, approach, and techniques. Method, approach, and technique. What do we mean by method? First, we we start from the right hand side. We said the technique is like sequential, tertib, or thematic, a theme. You take a tema, as they say in Swedish, a theme, uh, make a, 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 a subject. So sequential, like you go, you start from Surat Al-Fatiha, and then we, you continue Surat Al-Baqarah, and then Surat Al-Imran, Surat Al-Nisa, and all that, until you finish the tafsir of uh, the whole Quran uh, with Surat Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbin Nas. And that we, we have, most of our scholars, they have done in the past that kind of tafsir. Thematic tafsir is like you take a, 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 the theme of ruh. You check all the ayat in the Quran, which has the word ruh in it. And you try to make an interaction and a kind of tafsir al-Quran bil Quran and do holistic uh, uh, tafsir of it. And then you look into the, the hadith and all the different methods you apply on this uh, theme. You, so you take one theme, and you uh, you go broader and broader and broader in that theme. So that is called tafsirul uh, tafsirul uh, al mawdu'i tafsirul mawdu'i mawdu' means theme subject. You take a subject and then you go deep in it. So all the ayat like you take stars, wherever the najum are mentioned in the Quran, you take najm najum najum stars 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 what. What does Quran say, tell us about stars? What are hadith telling us about this ayat which talk about stars? So this is uh, the, the thematic tafsir. We, we mentioned this in a quite detail, but you can refer to our first and second session. This was an introduction. This is our map for this course. Then we said, what are the methods? So we said that let's take ruh. Now ruh, you can use the text of Quran to understand the Quran. Like, uh, what is the ruh? Look at the ayat which says, When they ask you about the ruh, tell them ruh is from the Amr of my Lord. Okay, then what is the Amr of my Lord? Amr Rabbi. That is in Surah Yasin. Innama amruhu. His Amr is nothing but. If he wants something, he says, Okay, so this Amr, what else there is about the Amr so that we can understand the ruh? So there is وَمَا أَمْرُنَا إِلَّا وَاحِدَةٌ كَلَمْحٍ بِالْبَصَرِ Our Amr is nothing but one, just a blink of an eye. So that it's, it, 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 it bypasses the, 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 the physical and the biological and the chemical and the mathematical system. And then immediately zapping happens and kun fayakun happens. That is in Surah Al-Qamar. And that Quran gives us the example about this Amr has been given to human, like Anbiya, like Prophet Isa was given this power of Amr to bring people back to life. 
Asif bin Barkhi, a successor of Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, was given this power. So he was able to bring the throne of Bilqis from Yemen to Palestine. So this is something which is, we are, we are still looking at the Quran. And then the Ruh. What is about the Ruh in the Ahadith? So we take the Ahadith of the Quran, Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, from Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, and the Ma'sumeen, the, the whole Ma'sumeen alayhi wasalam, and we see what did Ahlul Bayt tell us through the Prophet وسلم, with regards to this hadith uh, about the Ruh? So now we took the ayat which explains the Ruh, then we can take the hadith. So if we explain the ayat through ayat, we say Tafsirul Quran ibn Quran. That is the intratextuality of the Quran. And then if we say, if we take hadith explaining the, uh, the, uh, the ayat of the Ruh, then we have the issue of uh, tafsir al-Quran bil hadith. Let's say we take the history. We take the history about some ayat which are like ashabul fil. We take the history. Who were this? Who were this ashabul fil? Ah, they came from, because Quran doesn't tell us from where they come. The Quran doesn't tell us who was the guy who brought this elephant. So history tells us it was Abraha. Uh, they came from Yemen and uh, from Abyssinia basically, and then from Yemen. Uh, so now we know that, okay, so Abraha uh, is uh, somebody uh, who we know the name from the history and the people, they came uh, to invade Mecca and destroy the Holy Kaaba. We, we take it from the history because Quran tells us only that, haven't you seen how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with the people of the elephant? And the very short thing, so when, when we want details to explain this surah, we go to the history. And then science, like for example, when you see the, 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 the ocean, the salted ocean and the uh, uh, sweet uh, water and salt water, they get together. The, these are some scientific things, the, the differences in salinity. Uh, and then also the mountains are moving. How can we know the mountains are moving? So the science tells us that the crust of earth is moving. So, but, but, but as I mentioned previously, scientific facts and not scientific theories. Scientific theories gives probability. Scientific facts gives us the, the real uh, answers to the, uh, the explanation of some of the ayat of the Quran, which are related to the science. So that is tafsir of the Quran through the uh, natural science or any other sciences, uh, uh, psychology or other things. And the thing is that we need to have facts not um, probabilities, scientific theories are probabilities, but then if they are proven uh, through evidences and um, proper uh, supportive arguments, then yes, uh, we, we, can, we can take it as a source of tafsir because you can do tafsir using the intellect and the science. And then we come to this other part. So this is, now these are all texts, scientific texts, historical texts, hadith texts, Quran texts, and uh, so these, the, these are used to understand the tafsir of the Quran. And then using the intellect. Intellect could be personal opinions, like those mambo jambos, okay? So people, they say, oh, I feel that God says this. Oh, I, we said, keep your feelings to yourself. Give us evidences and arguments, solid logical arguments if you have. Otherwise, your feelings are not supposed to be the, the source for interpreting the Quran. Otherwise, you will have to choose your place in the hellfire. So no feelings, because Quran is an academic book, a very strong intellectual book. So you need to use intellect and logic in understanding the Quranic ayat and not personal opinions. Many times people, they say, my logic says, Baba, my logic is, is your personal opinion. We, we can't consider your logic as a, a source or as a something which is a solid thing. It's your personal opinion. Keep your personal opinion to yourself. So that is why uh, we have to be careful when, uh, when trying to explain the ayat of the Quran. But logical arguments, intellectual concepts, yes, they are used if they are solid. But if they are personal opinions, you can say, maybe God, like it seems that God wants, you can give probabilities, but not as, 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 a, as an interpretation, as a kind of conclusive arguments without using the intellectual arguments and logical arguments. So personal opinions should be avoided because they, those personal opinions can cause a person to choose a place in hellfire. So this is what we said about the method. So techniques, 
either we do sequence Quran uh, ayat by ayat, or we take a theme, theme and then look wherever that theme is available in the Quran, make a, a, an interaction with it. And then what are the methods? We can use only Quran by Quran, only Hadith, only history, or we can use an integrated approach. We use all these methods together and get a nice, nice uh, uh, integrated tafsir. Okay. And then we said lens approach. What is the approach? Like what is the lens you use? You see? So when, when you have this microscopic uh, uh, organisms, you see, you, you use certain degrees and certain lenses, certain colors nowadays, you have to use certain colors to see certain pigments in the cells. So these are lenses, different lenses, angles. So even in tafsir, we have different lenses. So approaches, what will be your approach? Because at the end of this course, you can easily write a small paper on tafsir for one page or two pages. Inshallah, we're going to give you that direction. So either uh, you have a literary approach. What does that mean? Let's come back to, let's take the topic of shaitan as I have explained previously. Shaitan or ruh shaitan. So literary. So every ayat of shaitan is in the Quran. We are going to check the linguistic beauty of it, like metaphors, like uh, uh, any balagha of the Quran, eloquence, any any elo eloquent point we will find in the sh uh, in the ayat of the shaitan. So we will we are going to take the shaitan uh, as, a, as a as a theme, and we will try to look uh, in it from the literary aspect. You can take one ayat, or you can take the the thematic approach, or you can do the, do the fiqhi lens angle. So how does the faqih look at the ayat of the shaitan? He will be basically looking at the ayat of waswasa. Uh, waswasa is like a whispering of the shaitan. You get this kind of thoughts that, oh no, my wudu is not right. My wudu is not right. My wudu is not right. That's shaitan messing up with your mind to make you repeat everything and then to, to make your life miserable. And then once and for all, you hate the religion. So that's why that is shaitan's idea to make you doubt in your ibadat repeatedly and cause this waswasa. So the fuqaha, they discuss this waswasa, uh, surat al-waswasa, min sharr al-waswasa al-khannas, okay, in surat qulaudu bir nas So they look at it, how can the waswasa be treated from the religion, uh, from the fiqhi aspect, from the jurisprudential. Sociological, what are the effects of uh, shaitan on the societies? So, for example, the societies were perished because of the shaitan's whispering. They started uh, worshipping idols. They started committing serious crimes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vanquished those societies. Ethical. How does the shaitan affect on, on people's moral values? Okay. So, uh, like, for example, uh, creating fitna, riba, backbiting, demeaning, uh, bringing people down. Hada min amal shaitan. Uh, killing each other. These are like moral influences of shaitan. So you will find those as uh, there are ayat they discuss about this topic. Uh, historical, what is the history of the shaitan? When is the shaitan first found in the history, in the Quran? So first is found in the scenario where Adam and Hawa, uh, the story, no, before that also, before that also, before the story of Adam and Hawa, the creation of the shaitan, like shaitan is a jinn and jinn are created. So, so there is a kind of creation of the shaitan and then the story of Adam and Hawa and then every story you find that the shaitan mentioned. So there's a timeline of the shaitan in the Quran until the day of judgment where the arguments of shaitan, no, no, yeah, God, I just whispered him. I'm not responsible for why, why he's dumping and the, he got deviated dumping on my shoulder kind of things are there at the end of the, so there's a historical lean, a lineage. So that, that timeline of the history. And then uh, ideological shaitan, uh, does he exist? Like ideological question. What is your proof that shaitan exists? You remember existence of God, existence of this, existence of that, uh, prophet exists. So these questions, I do. does shaitan exist? And how much is the uh, effect of the shaitan on the human being? And those kind of ideological questions are discussed in this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this lens. So you can make a paper out of ideological. So these, 
uh, when you write a thesis, it is very important that our youth, they learn to write the small, small tafsir papers because there is a big shortage in, Shi in Shia tafsir in the uh, Western academia. Because I was told by several professors that we don't have material from your school of thought. We have from other schools of thought, but we don't have in English and an academic style. So basically this will all this course will also teach you how to write small, small academic papers properly with proper references. And then later on post it on this academic uh, websites and academic uh, uh, places on your Facebook. So people, they benefit and uh, benefit from all these kind of um, papers. So uh, these small, small papers, like two, two pages or five pages, uh, taking an angle, this is what the Western Academy loves, to be focused on one topic, okay, and, and concentrate and look at it from depth. So you take one ayat or two, three ayat talking about the ideology of the shaitan, ideology of the existence, the evidence that he exists, evidence that he affects the human, okay, and, uh, and what are the tools, that also mystical. How does shaitan cause you a uh, deviation from the mystical? How do you, how does shaitan uh, decorate or or make you impressed by your deeds and mess up with your mystical connection with God? And what are the mystical negative effects of the shaitan? Political. The governments in the Quran, their government of Namrud, government of Fir'aun. How did the shaitan mess up with these governments and these political uh, institutions which uh, got corrupt? And how did the uh, uh, did uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam establish a, gover a government clean from the effects of the shaitan? So all these kind of uh, uh, political uh, the wars which were there in. Uh, uh, the, the, the mentioning how shaitan made these people who fight the righteous ones. And then educational aspect. Educational, we mean how does it affect or nurturing the children and the generation? What are the educational negative effects or the, which, which prevents proper educational or proper nurturing of the child? Terbiya, we call it terbiya. So all these kind of things are to, can be discussed from different angles. So if you are doing a, a PhD, then you have to choose one of the topics and then go deep inside and use these different methods. But in writing a short paper, you can barely write tafsir al-Quran, bil quran and you, you will not be able to. But master thesis, yes, you can have a, a broader uh, angle. But PhD, you can use that integrated approach, like, like take sociological aspect or ethical aspect, shaitan, uh, and its ethical effects on the communities. And then you can bring those ayat and bring a hadith explaining those ayat, bring the historical uh, events which shaitan has been able to destroy the communities and the science. You can make a holistic integrated paper on one topic, but broader from different angles. And that can be a PhD, uh, a PhD uh, paper. So this is something which is very important uh, to know uh, that our our theme we are going to discuss all these kind of uh, approaches uh, 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 methods we uh, we are going to discuss all these methods and then at the end you can use uh, 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 an approach from these approaches and write a small paper we had discussed that the uh, all these kind of introduction hadith of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib about the Quran we discuss and then. Uh, Again, um, and then what is the definition of interpretation? How does Sayyid al khui define the tafsir and the difference between the tafsir and the ta'wil and the muhkam and mutashabah? We, we mentioned that these allegorical verses to some scholars are not so allegorical. They are relatively alleg allegorical. So because they can be explained properly um, uh, by the <coughs> Ma'asum alayhi salam, by the time their verses, they were not understood, especially scientific verses uh, in the Quran. They were not in, understood in that time. They were allegorical in that time. Uh, now they are clear because of the ad advancement of the science and clarity of a lot of scientific phenomena mentioned in the Quran. And it became appear like the, uh, the, the mountains are moving 
Nobody knew how the mountains are moving. So they thought this is an allegorical verse, but now it is a very clear verse that the crust of earth is moving. So the mountains is, are moving as well. So, uh, and then also Allah wants us to, because there's nothing allegorical to the Ma'asum alayhi salam, because Ma'asum has the knowledge from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, we, uh, so it is one of the methods that we appreciate the infallibles alayhi salam and approach to Imams. Like many people, they did not approach to Imam, like God has hand. That is an allegorical verses, but they left the Imams who explain how it is allegorical, it's a metaphorical and not literally, not to be taken literally. And they took, uh, they went to the, 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 the Jewish and the Christian uh, who embraced Islam and started interpreting the Quran. And they took from them that God is physical hand. And so that was, uh, that was a problematic issue because they left the infallible Imams والسلام, after the Prophet والسلام, Because Quran wants, Quran is a book of knowledge, book of uh, academic book. Quran wants people to think, not believe blindly. Don't close your eyes, uh, just believe. No, Quran wants you to think and think and think. That's why he kept some riddles in, the, uh, in, uh, in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept some riddle in the Quran so that people will think. So it, it allows us to ponder and contemplate, thus promoting knowledge and intellectual activities. That is why after Islam, people, they were able to go to the moon and they discovered electricity and invention and discoveries were not there before Islam. They all started after Islam because Islam pushed people to think and to become scientists. So the first scientists uh, were uh, in large numbers were found in Muslim communities and in religious communities because uh, in, in the West, the, the, the religious communities fought science and scientists. But in Islam, no, they were embraced and appreciated and respected. And many scholars, religious scholars were scientists. So that is why to ponder and then keep the Quran living. So everything it becomes 100% clear in the, in the one time, then Quran will be closed, but that keeps the Quran living. So still people are thinking in the verses of the Quran. So this is something we mentioned detail in discussion in our previous session. And then uh, tafsir needs to be based on knowledge and not without knowledge that many people, they, they do tafsir of the Quran without knowledge. So we have to make sure that there is a knowledge, but if there are probabilities, then you give probable answers, but uh, you don't give uh, like, like something, a conclusive answer. If you have just a probability, it may be God might be, or God knows the best you see. So it may be, it can be, it might be, but don't say God means this, unless if you have an evidence of uh, saying so. And then after that, we have, uh, uh, we said tafsir without uh, knowledge is forbidden. And we discussed about the idea of Sayyid al khui That means even a scientist with, with, the, with the scientific interpretation based on knowledge. Because if, if the religious scholars, if they are not scientists, they cannot interpret the ayat of the Quran, which are related to science. They can give probabilities and, or they can approach to the scientists. And the scientists, uh, they have the knowledge of science, but they don't have the knowledge of Arabic language and uh, skills of tafsir and arts of tafsir. So we see sometimes the scientists come and they start like uh, authoritative and they start giving ayat of the tafsir. We have to be careful that knowledge doesn't mean only knowledge of science, knowledge of science plus knowledge of uh, interpretation of the Quran and the tools of interpretation of the Quran. And the, so, so we have to go through the tafsir of the ulama and check out how they do the tafsir and check out the scientific uh, facts which we have and try to do some amalgamation and try to come up with a proper conclusion. And then uh, Sayyid al Khui said, not enough work done. He says, still, I mean, like, like ima imagine Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says that if I'll do the tafsir of the Quran, 100 camels would not be able to carry. And we said, how much load can a camel carry? Let's say uh, uh, 200 kg. And we said that how 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 much is the, would would the weight of like a, a book like this be? So because we have like this kind of volume, twenty volumes maximum until or maybe some scholars they have done thirty volumes. That's the maximum volume of a book, Quran, which is six thousand six uh, six hundred six thousand uh, six hundred something ayat of the Quran. So let's say about six thousand ayat. So let's say if uh, uh, Imam Ali says hundred camels would not be able to carry. 
So let's do some math here and try to see how can, uh, how can that be. So basically, if we are going to do the tafsir al-Qur'an bil Qur'an, uh, let's try to see if uh, we have about 6,000 ayat. So we have 6,000 multiplied by 6,000. If we are going to just do tafsir, just tafsir al-Qur'an bil Qur'an, we're not talking about the using the hadith. So let, let's put these zeros down. So we have, we have, okay, 36 million probabilities. So anyhow, so many probabilities, see how rich Quran is. So, so that means the Quran is living until the day of judgment because until now, Sayyid al-Khuri says not enough work is done. Because many times uh, many time people think, how can it be living miracle? Yes, it is living because it's still now you have not discovered the, all the secrets of the Quran. It's not, just, uh, it's not just us we are saying. There is a professor uh, which is called Ang Angelika Neuwith. Uh, she is uh, a German professor, a non-Muslim. You will find her works on YouTube as well, her lectures. She says every community comes puts a layer of understanding of the Quran and adds on the interpretation of the Quran. Every community comes. That means the Quran is living. The Quran is there. It, it is a potential book for, of research. Every time people will come and they will look from different angles, they will discover different secrets of the Quran. They will add on, add on, add on. And that's it. 36 million probabilities. How, for your information, Western people, they are not many of these non-Muslims, they are doing researches on the Quran because they find the Quran rich historical book. For them, it's not a miracle. For them, it's a rich historical book, which is worth of investigating. This lady, she's about, I don't know, 70 years, 80 years, she's very old. Uh, and she's still doing work on Quran. And she's trying to discover those add-ons. She's non-Muslim, but she's interested. She's impressed by the Quran. Okay. And our, we Muslims, we have left the Quran on the shelves and we open the Quran on the, in the holy month of Ramadan for the barakat and for the blessings. And we make a, a metal detector kind of thing. We pass underneath it when we travel, which is not bad because Quran has that spiritual effect as well. It's a miraculous book without any doubt. But that is not the main purpose of the Quran. The main purpose is the, of the Quran is it's a living uh, book packed with knowledge, which needs to be unpacked. And that is the duty of the Muslims to do these kind of courses, to try to understand the tafsir of the Quran, the depth of the tafsir of the Quran, and start working on thematic tafsirs. Thematic tafsirs are very important nowadays. Sequential tafsir is there. It's, uh, it's available in so many books. Allama Tabatabai, Tibyan Sheikh Tusi, Ayatollah Nasir Makarim, Namuna or Amthal or Enlightening. All these are there, but but we we are really have a problem. We have we have very less work done in thematic tafsir, like theme. Ayatollah Nasir Makarim has Nafahat al Quran. He has done thematic tafsir. He has taken Usul al Din, like a Tawheed. All the ayat which are there about Tawheed. A stacked in one or two volumes. All the ayat about al-adil, nubuwat, imamat. So he has done this kind of uh, work, but still the small, small papers are very important, more focused into topics and ayat, and then broadening those ayat. So let's say you wrote 10 papers or 15 papers on the darfi, for example, if there are 15 ayat of ruh, you wrote 15 small papers on ruh, those ayat. Then it, uh, the, the next stage is to try to interact these uh, understandings which you have collected, tafsir which you have collected about this, tafsir al-Quran, ibn quran And then you go broader, right? The third stage of papers you write on this ayat is using a hadith uh, uh, elaborating. And then finally you write a book of the ruh, that how the ruh is in the Quran, ruh in the Quran kind of book and try to uh, use your work which you have made. Uh, so, so what we are trying to do in this course is uh, to make you productive uh, mufassirin or those who are, but obviously you will not be mufassir in the sense independent, 
No, you will be using the tafsir of our scholars because unless you become a mujtahid, then you can have the privilege of uh, becoming mufassir, independent mufassir, presenting your opinion, uh, rebuttaling the opinion of the mufassir, tabatabai or nasir makarim or this. But at this point, we are mufassir in, 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 in sense that we take the tafsir of our scholars which are in Arabic, or and we make a focused paper and present it to the Western world, or even our youngsters and coming generation, because you know these small, small papers it is going to make a, like a five minute YouTube clip and you can post it there. So our generation, they don't want one one hour lectures. It's you guys, how's the students, you can have these kind of things, but for lay people, they just want to know concepts of the Quran, so five minutes or three, four minutes of the video clip and they are satisfied uh, with the answer and they, they, get, they connect the Quran in their life with their intellect with a lot of things. So they give them opportunity. Like this project is not available. There are very few, uh, few scholars, they have done this and that's not that much and it's not enough. So, so therefore uh, we go back to our uh, slide and uh, see, um, uh, yes, so uh, Sayyid al Khui said not enough work done and you can go back to the lecture. The second uh, lecture was again, we showed you uh, the index and we explained more. And then uh, we said that uh, what is the subject of the tafsir, the Holy Quran, the aim of the science of tafsir to understand and explain the concepts and the objectives of the Quranic verses. And then we said method and approach, definition of tafsir, we continued. Uh, the method of Quran by Quran, and today's session is this one. So that was just a, a small gist, but obviously you can go back to those lectures are available on our website on YouTube. You can um, you can go back to them, and then so basically these sessions, inshallah, they are going to last until this end of the year. So uh, after that, inshallah, you will be able to attend our. Uh, researches of tafsir sessions once a week. Uh, we have every Sunday, we have a, a tafsir session. So we, you can attend these tafsir sessions and get a broader view of uh, uh, certain ayat uh, together. So uh, let's see this lesson three. So now uh, at the book I'm using is the book of ICAS. Uh, and obviously I used uh, Al-Bayan of Sayyid al khui in my introduction. But I, uh, and I, for those who are researchers, they want to read more. The book is of Isfahani. It's translated, I have it on Arabic as well. So it's Persian, Arabic, and English. Uh, and I have kept the pages where you can find this material in the book. So you as a researcher, you will, you will be able to find these, um, these books, uh, the, uh, this stuff. So basically I've summarized from page nine to 127. The whole thing is this is an indexing as I did there. So he is Fahani also. So, so basically our course is methods of tafsir, okay? When you write a paper, you can take an approach. So we said method of tafsir could be by text or could be by, uh, by um, uh, intellect. Intellect could be personal and could be, um, could be uh, logical. Personal, we said we don't use personal opinions in tafsir. We use logical arguments, intellectual arguments, solid arguments get so to give us solid conclusions. So he says that there are false methods and there are reliable method. False method, like tafsir bir ra'i, my opinion. But for your opinion based on what? No, it's my personal opinion. I think like that. Okay, please keep it to yourself. I don't want your personal opinion. If you have any argument, intellectual argument, logical argument, please present it to support your opinion. Otherwise, I don't want your opinion. Thank you so much, you, you, uh, you have your opinion. And then we have this, uh, uh, another tafsir al-ishara. This is like mambo jambos, like hocus pocus. Oh, I feel God is talking to me. I feel God is the, uh, I, uh, those kind of uh, ishara, they call it, elusive. And there's, there's too much tafsir of ra'i packed in the personal opinions uh, of a person's spiritual. If, if somebody has the right to do that kind of tafsir is ma'asum alayhi salam. Other than ma'asum, they cannot give us their mambo jambos. So therefore, uh, that is to keep them for themselves. And then we have scientific, like using 
using Darwinian's theory, which is not proven scientifically. Uh, so they, they use this to, to do the tafsir of the ayat of the Quran or using some theories which are not proven scientifically. And uh, they are using these kind of uh, uh, even evolution theory. Evolution theory, it is not strongly. Yes, there are some connections, but there are some uh, some gaps as well. They have not explained. Uh, they have not supported. So they say if A is like that, C is like that, there has to be B. Well, we you can't say there has to be B. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bypass the B, bring A to C. So there are apes. Now there is human. And Allah created Adam from clay. Now let's say they find us that B. Okay. They found fossils and they found evidence. It's everything because now the more they did finding, the more they get scattered because so many species popped up from the earth. Now they got, because I was watching one of the documentaries. So it's not like one ape, like there's so many species of apes and then which ape led to the evolving human. So there is a lot of confusion more and more. So that, that they don't tell the, the, the students in the schools and universities. They just show them one lineage of apes and then there's presto human being popped up at the end. So they, 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 they need to be truthful with the people and not lie to them and deceive them, especially our kids and generation. Yeah, because there is there are so many scattered direction now. So which type of ape, which type of species, which type of this? So these are the things which... Um, which is very important for us to understand that these are like uh, people, they start uh, using the Quran to justify the, tafsir, the, the theory of evolution. Uh, that is not right. Yes, you can say probability. This ayat may be indicating the evolution because there are certain ayat in the Quran which indicates uh, evolution. And uh, so what about Adam? Well, Adam was uh, separate. Because some of our ulama is like Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Sayyid al-Bahishti, Sayyid Muhammad Sadiq al-Sadr. We don't have a problem in a, a theory of evolution per se, as long as we say Adam salam was created separately. Okay? Uh, but, and then he, was, he came to guide the community which was already there, which was evolved. For example, I'm saying for example. So, uh, but give us evidences. Don't give us theories. You see, the, the problem is that we don't have a problem with evolution because we can solve the, like Prophet Isa alayhi salam was born without father. Adam alayhi salam was uh, created in a community already there to guide this community and take them out from animals mentality to the humans mentality, make them human uh, intellectually. So, so we don't have that serious problem by people evolving from apes to human as long as Adam alayhi salatu was almost created separately according to the apparent meaning, uh, verses of the Quran. So, so therefore, there's a lot of discussion there. I'm not opening this portal here because our, uh, when we will talk about evolution in Quran, then we can go deep and bring all the discussions about the scholars. But at this point, I'm just mentioning here, scientific, can we use scientific findings uh, to do the interpretation of the Quran. If you use theories, then that is tafsir bir ra'i. That is the, that is that is false method. You can you cannot say, oh, this is because uh, Quran says this and the, the evolution theory. No, if evolution theory is becomes a fact and proven like as a fact with evidences and and all, all these kind of things, then obviously. But the whole question comes: the scientific method is all about observation. Who observed evolution? You are observing the fossils, and there are gaps, and you are you are not able to reach to from A to C with a B. So there's a B missing in the middle, and now you want to prove that evolution happened without even having a B component in the middle. Uh, that, that they used to call missing link, and they tried to find out missing link. They found so many more probabilities indicating, oh, this could be this, 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 this is. So now B as is B1, B2, B3, which B is actually the link between the apes and the human. So still there is no fact there to prove evolution. So yes, if evolution is proven by observation, by finding proper uh, facts and figures, then yes, you can use that, uh, that to uh, explain some of the ayat of the Quran, which indicates evolution indirectly. 
And some some might indicate directly, but the, the more, there are a few ayat which indicate indirectly. Or some of some of our doctors they have collected these ayat also. But still, I it's it's I told them it's a probability. Nice work done, but it's just a probability and not a fact. So we don't know that this ayat is talking about evolution or talking about something else. So therefore, this is a kind of like use uh, scientific theories, not facts, to uh, uh, to give conclusive uh, tafsir, and that is wrong. And then reliable methods like. Uh, uh, some are incomplete, like using only Quran by Quran. It's incomplete. A big, a big, uh, yes, it is the strongest method because Quran is word of God. So only God knows what he meant or his messenger. So hadith, if you want, if you are using authentic hadith, tawatur hadith, then obviously uh, it's a fact. But if you are using a sahih hadith or probable hadith, then you are giving a probability. Intellectual, if you're using sound logical arguments, intellectual concepts, yes, then you are giving intellectual conclusions. And then accepted ishara, you know that mambo jambo hocus focus, I feel and I God and I this and God, uh, I feel God wants to say like that. <laughs> Those kind of things, if it is supported by logical arguments, intellectual arguments, by Quran, hadith properly, then it is called accepted ishara. Okay, because that one we said it is rejected ishara, it's elusive, uh, and but this is accepted means it is based on proper intellectual concepts and argument. So this is incomplete. Why you can use either Quran, either this, but if you use all of these, then it is co considered comprehensive, kamil, complete. Why? Because you use every single uh, method in the tafsir, and that is called ijtihadi, tafsir ijtihadi. Jama, complete, uh, integrated, uh, holistic, combining all the approaches. Now, uh, on page nine, Isfahani mentions that the, the uh, different methods on dealing with the text. So, Shia Athna Ashari, we have Zahir, we have Batin, apparent meaning and non apparent meaning. Sayyid al Khuy Quddha Sisaro mentions that whenever you look at, into the ayat of the Quran, you have to go first apparent meaning. Uh, to take the first thing is apparent. What does it mean apparently? Then if you have evidence, a clue, karina, to divert your mind from literal to the metaphorical meaning, then you go to take the batani meaning. But without a karina, you cannot take the batan meaning. And your karina, your clue, if it's a fact, then you give a conclusive argument, conclusive indication that the Baltan meaning was intended. But if it was just a, a, a probability, then you will give uh, maybe God has intended the metaphorical meaning and not the literal meaning because there may this clue, because many of these hadith are weak hadith. So if you use weak hadith to go to the tafsir of Baltan, the, the metaphorical meaning you are going to take, then we are going to tell you that's a probability. But if you are going to take a strong hadith to uh, interpret the tafsir, taking it from the zahir to batin, then obviously you are giving a, a fact or a strong indication. The apparent meaning and the hidden meaning with the karina or the contextual clue. So that is ithna ashariya, shia ithna ashariya. Then Ismailiyah, they are called, many of them, uh, they are called Batiniyah. Now Ismailiyah, maybe their firqa, Isfahani says that they took the Batini meaning, the hidden and symbolic meanings, not just the hidden, but symbolic. What do they mean by sim symbolic? Symbolism. They say, Inna salata kanat al -a kitab in Your salat is Imam of Ismailiyah, Agha Khan. He is your salat. So Allah wants you to observe him, uh, meet him, communicate with him. Your hajj is Agha Khan. Your zakat, pay tax to Agha Khan. Everything is focused on this Ismaili Imam. Uh, <clears throat> that is according to many of the Ismaili uh, groups uh, that the, they, they, they go without Karina to the Ta'wil and they go to symbolic meaning and they go away extreme. 
until some of the Ismaili groups uh, long time ago, they used to have this uh, uh, kind of thing. That means um, God is in the Ismaili Imam. That means the Ismaili Imam is manifestation of God, like Jesus Christ, for example, to many of the Christian Trinitarian and those kind of people that say that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of God on earth. So they used to say Ismail, like the, the Nusairis, they said uh, Imam Ali is manifestation of God on earth. So he's God actually. So they gave divinity to Ismaili Imam, some of the uh, groups like Duru's and those uh, ancient groups. Nowadays, I don't know because they are, they're kind of not so clear, but uh, so that is, uh, there's too much hulu in the Ismaili. Then some Sunni sects, they have Vahir meaning and based on their beliefs as well. So apparent meaning, uh, some of so like this Asha'ira, like God as hand, they take everything literally, Zahiri. And then Mu'tazila Sunnis, they take the theological aspect and intellectual method. So Shias also, they take this aspect. So the, so the methods and approaches uh, can overlap, um, can overlap and still it would be harmonious tafsir. So this is Isfahani on page 10. Okay, so now techniques of tafsir. We spoke about this. So sequential tafsir based on the arrangement of the Quranic codex. We start doing tafsir of Surah Al Bismillah, Surah Al Hamd, go one by one, ayat by ayat until we finish Al Surah Al Nas. Majority of our tafsir books, they have taken this approach uh, based on the descent of the verses. Now, some, some people, they, they, have, they have made a list these verses descended first. So they have made a timeline, a timeline of the Quranic verses. These verses descended like Iqra Bismi Rabbik Alladhi Khalaq was first, and then uh, I think Muzzamil and Muddathir and this and that, then Makkans finished, and then Medina starts. So this is the Tartib, original Tartib of the descent of the Quran. But then, as it is mentioned, that the Prophet وسلم, compiled it in a uh, in a surah, in, in a surah forms, the way it is, it was presented by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If it was not like that, Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasallam had his time golden ages of his khilafat. He would have brought that, uh, uh, re removed this and brought the original tafsir, original Quran back, which was like a. But no, we say our argument that whatever Quran is available. It was in the time of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. That means Imam Ali approved it, acknowledged it. If it was not the same Quran, uh, so many people they say this Qur the Quran was descend in the in in the sequential way, Meccans and the. How come we have now jumbled up Quran? Some are Meccan, Madanan, and etc. No, this was not done by the companions, because if it was done by the companions, the Imam Ali alayhi salam would have brought it back. It was done by the Prophet وسلم, and his direction and the surahs were compiled in the time of the Prophet وسلم, and his companions, they used to memorize the surahs and the surahs are mentioned in the time of the Prophet in the hadith of the Prophet So that means the surahs were there already because the ayat were being descended in sequence then the, and they were formed in the surahs. But some surahs, a certain ayat Makki, certain ayat Madani, that means the surah part of it was descended here, part of it was descended there. But then there are narrations mentioning whoever recites this surah, whoever recites this surah. So that means that the surah was the integrity of the surah composed with Meccan and Madan and Ayat were done by the Prophet. Uh, <clears throat> then we have thematic tafsir mawdu'i, we said. A single theme is collated and studied together, taken from various verses of the Quran, speaking about the same theme or topic. Uh, hadith and so on. So, Mafahim Qur'aniya uh, on the five roots of religion. Ayatollah Ja'far Subhani. Yes, I forgot to mention that also. So, we have Ayatollah Nasir Makarim as Nafahat al Quran, and uh, we have uh, Ayatollah Sheikh Ja'far Subhani. He has uh, roots of religion, uh, which he calls it Mafahim Qur'aniya. Um, some uh, are short in one book, Tafsir Mawdu'i. Uh, and the tafsir is either 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 sequential tafsir, like tafsir said Abdullah Shubbar. It's one book. 
Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Mughni, it's one book, a whole Quran. So the tafsir is basically like footnotes. So you have the text in the middle, and on the sides, you will see the tafsir. So it's one book of tafsir, or Quran entirely. There's a brief, some a short tafsir. Some books, they go into the volumes. Uh, they could be 20 volumes or more. Uh, so the tafsir, tafsir bil ma'thur, a tafsir using the text. So we have this tafsir of Quran using the Quran, like ruh. What is ruh? Ruh is from the amr. What is amr? Amr is from kuyaf kun fayakun, and the characteristics of amr. So so you use just the Quran, or tafsir of Quran by riwaya, by narrations, hadith, like for example. There's a guy, he was holding these two threads, black and white, okay, uh, in the time of Fajr. He wants to see when the Fajr will come. So the Prophet said, uh, uh, what are you doing here? So he said, I'm try trying to see when will I be able to see the, distinguish the black thread from the white thread, uh, uh, putting it in front of me, when I'm able to distinguish, because Quran says, eat and drink, like in the holy month of Ramadan, until the white thread is distinguished from the black thread. So he said, but this is the hadith. The Prophet said, it's not like that. It is the, the bands, the, the white band, the, the brightness of the day and the darkness of the night. When they are in a way that they are in two bands, they are distinguished. These are the threads which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. So the, the, the guy, he took it literally. But then the Prophet said that these are metaphorical terms uh, the, the applied on the bands, the, 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 the band white uh, brightness of the day. And on the top of it, you will find the darkness of the night, which I, uh, we, we showed in our fiqh class, the photos also and images taken, which obviously shows that they're like bands. Tafsir al-Quran by linguistic, like tafathahum. What is tafathahum? It's a really weird word, okay? So uh, nowadays they don't use it. So in, when you go to the dictionary and find out tafathahum in old language, old uh, Arabs, they used to call like filthy parts of the body, like something you get rid of it, like, like uh, uh, extra hair on the body or um, nails and these kind of things. So these are... Cleaning up, cleaning up extra parts of the body, such as hair and nail, a very ancient word known by the lexicon, by the linguists. Then we have tafsir al-Quran by the history. Like we have qutila ashab al in one of the surahs of the Quran. Who are these ashab al -ukhdud? Khad means trench, okay? So it seems that there was some godly Christian, uh, uh, the, the king of their time was uh, a pagan, uh, not a good person. He hate Christian. He hate followers of Jesus Ali Salatu Islam before Islam. So before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he dug a trench, and he uh, told the, the he told these people to dig a trench, and they, he dumped all these uh, godly Christian into this trench and burned them alive. So that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is uh, mentioning the the Qutil Ashabul. Uhdud. So this is number one, tafsir of the Quran in these four categories. Quran by Quran, the best method, then Quran by Hadith. The, if the narration is strong, then it's a conclusive conclusion. If the narration is not strong, it gives us probability. Tafsir al-Quran by linguists, and then also tafsir al-Quran uh, by the history to get information from the history. So we have an ayat, but we don't know. There's no hadith, there's no ayat. So we look into the history. Who are these Uhdud people of Uhdud? We find those who are noble Christians and they were buried, uh, they were burned alive in a trench. And then we have also tafsir explanation of the uh, scholars, jurists, mujtahideen, fiqh. So this tafsir fiqh, that means there are, there are certain ayat in the Quran, about 500, maybe plus minus uh, ulamas, they have differences of opinion in this. So there are about 500 ayat in the Quran. They only talk about fiqh, like hajj and salat and zakat and wudu and tayammum and all these kind of things. These are called ayatul ahkam. These, they have a different fiqh approach of interpretation of the Quran. They have to really be careful not to use other than solid uh, evidences like solid hadith and sahih hadith 
all those kind of things to uh, to get a fatwa because fatwa is a very serious tafsir of the Quran, either Quran by Quran or Quran by Hadith. Like our maraja, they do tafsir of the Quran, so they are the top of the mufassirin. Uh, but they uh, they focus a lot on tafsir of the ayat of ahkam fiqh. Um, so uh, earliest uh, the earliest method, um, Quran tafsir Quran by Quran. Isfahan he says the early it's the earliest method and the best method. So before even a hadith come, people would understand the Quran, uh, try to relate the ayat of the Quran. And it is universally accepted. Shias, they accepted and practice. Sunnis, they accepted. Except for few, they have problem in tafsir Quran bil Quran. It's essential for thematic tafsir. Obviously, you will have a word ruh. You, have, you want to explain the word ruh. So you will take all the ayat of the Quran from different places and bring it in a, a, a pot and make a mixture of it and cook a harissa Risa or coca kichri or kichro out of it, uh, which is delicious, and you will find different tastes of different spices. This ayat and that ayat. So you so you make a, a kind of interaction with all these ayat because Sayyid al Khui says God knows best what he meant. So if we take the ayat of the Quran to interpret the ayat of the Quran, then that is the best approach. Then we have. <clears throat> Uh, this word which says al quran ba'dhuhu yufassir al ba'd part of the quran explains other part of it and some of the western academics they call it uh, juxtaposing juxtaposing uh, the verses that means there are mutual evidence indicating the meaning intended by god so you you ju juxtapose the verses together to 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 bridge it together to bring it together and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa used it. Uh, infallibles alayhi wa used it. Uh, Imams use it. Like for example, Imam al-Jawad alayhi salatu wa sallam, we were sitting beside Ma'mun, and then there was this issue. A guy had uh, stolen some uh, uh, something, and they brought in front of Ma'mun. So uh, there was this issue. Quran says, cut the hand, okay? Uh, if after conditions are applicable, obviously, you don't just cut the hand of anybody steals, no. There are conditions and the judge needs to make the decree. You don't bring your son and bring uh, bring your hand and chop off his hand. You can't do like that. You, the, the law is to done by uh, the Muslim jurist. He looks at the circumstances and everything to try to not to punish him. But if he's guilty as charged, then the, the marja or the mujtahid, uh, the authority, Islamic authority is forced to punish. They don't want to punish because the Prophet ﷺ said, keep the punishment away as much as possible. This is what the Westerners do not know, unfortunately, because the whatever has gone to the Westerners is negativity. But the Prophet used to say, idra'ul hudud bishubuhat. Keep away the, the penalties by making confusion, making doubts, create doubts. No, maybe he did not do it. Maybe he was not that. And Imam Ali Alisam has several incidences. He practiced this kind of direction. So don't judge the people immediately and punish them like the second Khalifa used to do like that. But Imam Ali Alisam used to know, used to avoid punishing people as much as possible unless if guilty as charged where, where all these strong evidences and there was no room left for any benefit of doubt. So give the benefit of doubts and push the penalties away. Don't punish the people unless if it's really, really, really into that. So th that's the decision of the judge. The judge has to decide. So that people, they don't know about Islam. And unfortunately, how will they know? Because we don't know. Our communities, they don't know how beautiful Islam is. All what we know is punish, 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 because that's how we're appraised. Uh, since childhood in the Middle East. So that's why the, that's the whole only concept we have. But no, keep the punishment away. So therefore, um, the, the Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam's times when this person was guilty as charged, there's no room. So Ma'mun said that, who can tell me how to cut the hand? Everybody said from, well, from this, 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 this is the hand, this is the hand. So they uh, Ma'mun said, Imam al-Jawad, what do you think? Uh, after all this... I, nothing is left for me. I mean, everybody said whatever. He said, no, I want to hear. He said, no, you have this, this, you can follow them. He said, no, no, I want to hear from you. He said, 
Imam said that only fingers, not hand, not hand. He said, uh, what is your evidence? From the, so this is Tafsir al-Quran ibn quran Imam Muhammad al-Jawad said that, in al-masadid lillahi these masadid, this is place of prostration. Leave it for Allah. That means don't cut the whole, whole thing which a person does sujood. Just take a part of it. So that's why that is the Quran bil Quran. So our aimmas alayhi salam they use tafsir al Qurani bil Quran. So juxtaposing like the vulm, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you see, had this uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and juxtaposing. So Isfahan he says on page 16 when he uses this ayat, alladhina amanu walam yalbisu imanahum bi vulmin. Those people who became believers and do, did not associate uh, their faith, believe with uh, an act of injustice, okay? Act of wrongdoing, act of uh, something haram. For them is the security. They will be secured, okay? And muhtadun, and they will be guided. The Prophet ﷺ told them to refer to Ayat 31.13. So what is this zulm? They believed, but they did not associate with zulm. So, so that means, can a person become infallible? According to this ayat, that means they never ever did wrongdoings. They believed, that means they became infallible. So only infallibles have security. So we are going to be doomed in the hellfire. So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, this is not what was meant. This zulm, means shirk, idol worshipping. They were purely monotheistic. So if they make mistakes, they seek forgiveness, Allah will give them security. Allah will be, guide them. Okay? So, so that means this zulm here in this ayat is not every wrongdoing. It's not every forbidden act. No. It is specifically وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِإِبْنِهِ When Luqman told his son وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ and he was guiding him. Ya Bunay, oh my son, la tushrik billah. Do not uh, make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Verily, uh, making our partners with God, polytheism is a great act of injustice. So, this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is using tafsir al Qurani bil Quran. He's explaining this dhulm with this ayat. Did you see? So the Prophet used it. And our Imams, they used it, as I mentioned in the story of Imam Muhammad al-Jawad. Imam Ali used it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So this is an issue of uh, pregnancy. Okay? So there was a case where some uh, a, a woman, she brought a child uh, and it was six months old. So they doubted that before the marriage, she must have done act of adultery or act of wrongdoing. So they, they were going to punish her. So Imam Ali says, slow down, slow down. What is happening? So no, because uh, she brought a child. How can a child be in six months? So Imam Ali said, look at the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, the mother carried the child. Uh, so carrying the child and uh, the whole thing is in two years. So, that means two years. So, the mother carried a child and she nursed the child. She gave milk for two years. So, how many years mother gives milk? Two years. How many months are these? 24 months. And look at another ayat which says, uh, so she she suffered. There was a burden. This pregnancy is really a big burden. So be respectful to your mothers. Okay, remember she has gone through, suffered through a lot of pain to get you in this world. And the, the delivery, it's worse. So painful process. Here Allah says, وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا The pregnancy and the... The, the, the nursing, feeding milk, is 30 months. So here we had 24 months of feeding. 
here 30 months of feeding and pregnancy. So that means take 24 months out. That means six months are left. And those months are the minimum time of pregnancy. See, Imam Ali uses mathematics. Salamu alayhi. These two ayat. So again, maybe some of you got confused. This ayat tells nursing time is 24 months. Good. This ayat says the pregnancy time plus nursing time is 30 months. Take 24 months out of 30, six months. So Imam Ali says the Quran says pregnancy can be six months and a child can be born. Like Imam Hassan and Hussein, والسلام, they were born in six months of pregnancy. Imam Muhammad al-Bakr says that uh, if you travel, for example, okay, then there's no problem that you do your Salat Qasr. فلا, uh, there is no harm. So that means the Quran is giving me option. Why our ulama says you have to do Qasr when you travel, you cannot pray full Salat. But here, this, this ayat says that there is no harm, that, that you have an option. If you want to do Qasr, you can do Qasr. If you want to pray fully, that is what's understood when the, from the word Fala junaha alaykum. Fala junaha, falaysa alaykum junahun. Falaysa alaykum junahun. This is what they understand that it's okay. You can do qasr. You can do qasr. Not you have to. So they say, here the ayat doesn't impose a qasr on me. Why our scholars, they say, so Imam Muhammad al-Baqar, this was the debate in that time, the time of Imam Muhammad al-Baqar. Imam Muhammad al-Baqar says that, um, look at this ayat of Safa al marwa Inna Safa al marwa min sha'ir Allah. These are from the uh, sacraments, from the symbols which take you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whoever performs hajj of the house and does the umrah, hajj al-bayta wa itamara, fala junah ali. Okay. The word junah has been used here as well. The word junah has been used. Fala junah ali ayyattawwafa bima. There is no problem uh, that uh, there is no harm. There is no, no issue. He can do uh, tawaf. He can do tawaf of Safa and Marwa. Yes, he can do. No. Imam Muhammad al-Baqir said the entire Muslim community, they say Safa and Marwa is wajib. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word junah. So here also offering short salat is wajib. So the word junah could mean there is no problem in doing it. And it also could be uh, that it is obligatory to include uh, or to do perform the Salat in Qasr. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَيْسَ alaykum junah or فَلَا junah, that means at some people they had problems. Should we really be doing Safa and Marwa? Safa and Marwa is wajib. So what about their problems in Safa and Marwa? No, there are no problems in Safa you have to do. What about Qasr? What about if I can offer Salat uh, Tamam? So there is no problem in a uh, uh, in, 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 in Qasr. I don't want to offer Qasr. I, I feel, I say, I see there are problems in Qasr. So no, you have to offer Qasr. There are no problems in Qasr. See, no, why? I'm healthy. I can offer. Why should I pray two rakat instead of four rakat? No. So, so, so you feel that offering Qasr is problematic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, no, offering Qasr is not problematic. That doesn't mean it's not wajib. You see the word junah, where it fits? So you have to understand the whole context. So the, as there are people, they consider offering qasr problem. Why should we offer qasr if we can offer? Why should we offer safa and marwa? There, there, there were idols on safa and marwa, okay? Uh, so no, you have to. There were idols. Even if there are idols, there is no problem in doing safa and marwa. But I can, even if you can, there is no problem in doing qasr. You have to do qasr. So if you feel there's a problem in doing qasr because you can offer tamam, there's no problem. So the la junaha, there's no problem in it. It doesn't mean that it's not wajib. No, it is wajib. But the misconception you have, that misconception is not a, a, a something which is valid. So that is what uh, Imam Muhammad al-Bakr was indicating that Safa al-Marwa, as Allah says, la junaha, here laysa alaykum junah, 
that doesn't mean that it's not wajib. It is wajib. But the misconceptions which were there in the mindset of the people in that time, uh, that is to be removed. So at this point, we are looking at the our aimmas alayhi salatu wasalam. They used tafsir al Quran bil Quran. Our scholars, uh, our scholars, may Allah have this uh, His mercy upon them. Uh, may Allah be pleased with them. Allama Majlis used uh, juxtaposing in Bihar al Anwar such as stories of the prophets. Ali Muslatu he brought all the ayat together about a prophet and jumbled up them together. The roots of religion and so on. Allama Tabatabai and Al Mizan uses juxtaposing in many verses. He says, Quran expounds on everything and it must be therefore clarify itself as well. So Quran clarifies itself as well. Tehrani, Ayatollah Tehran in his Tafsir al Furqan, he says, similarly uses Tafsir al Quran al Quran. Al Khatib uh, he is a Sunni scholar, also uses Tafsir al Quran al Quran. And Al Balaghi also in Allah al Rahman uses Tafsir al Qurani bil Quran. So our scholars, they use Tafsir al Qurani bil Quran. And then the, the arguments about the supporting that, what are the arguments of supporting Tafsir al Quran bil Quran? Uh, why not? We will leave it for our next session, insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala